Thanks, Anker. Uh, good morning to all, and thanks for logging in. For this discussion, we are going to start by examining uh, an EC Article 501-125B, looking at what it allows regarding application of uh, TFC motors to Class 1 Div 2 areas, and then drilling down a little bit to find some historical and technical background for the application. So, getting started, uh, as Eddie mentioned, Section 501-125B3 of the code allows the use of open or non-explosion proof type motors in Class 1 Div 2 areas. So as long as they don't have any arcing, sparking devices, and so on, such as brushes or fans. It follows then that TFC motors without brushes, switching mechanisms, or the like, uh, don't need to be identified, listed, or marked specifically for use in Class 1 Division 2 areas. On the other hand, if a motor contains arcing or sparking devices, such as lip rings, brushes, and so on, they must not be used in Class 1 Div 2 locations unless an acceptable mitigation method is applied and that we can find some plausible methods in Article 500.7 of the code. Uh, also note, when we talk about TFC motors in this discussion, we're generally referring to motors 4,000 volts or less and 500 horsepower, horsepower or less, which are fairly common. Um, okay, um, we're also including in the discussion motor, motor, motor anti-condensation heaters, since they are commonly uh, specified. Now, these heaters uh, must be considered as a potential ignition source. NEC 501-125B also covers space heaters, but under paragraph four. The code requires the heater surface temperature to not exceed 80% of the IIT of the gas or vapor involved, of course. Uh, otherwise, the space heater must be identified for use in class one, two locations. So as you can see in the slides, we also mentioned the common practice of specifying uh, space heaters ready for 240 volts and yet supplying them at 120 volts. This may add to the lifespan of the heater, but does result in a couple of possible issues. First, mostly a performance issue, is that only 25% of the wattage at the rated voltage is produced. Also reducing the amount of heat and therefore may not be possible uh, to keep off uh, condensation from forming. Secondly, motor manufacturers may not be willing to provide 240 volt rated heaters for a 120 volt application because of concerns that they may be inadvertently connected to 240 volts and then possibly resulting in a temperature exceeding 80% of the AIT. All right. So now uh, let's dig a little bit further into uh, 501-125B and we'll find five informational notes. Uh, as a quick aside, informational notes are not enforceable themselves, meaning that they are not mandatory, but they do provide us with references and other information uh, related to, to code requirements that include a, and includes alerting us to information we need to consider in order to comply with the particular code requirement. So today we're only going to focus on information on notes one and three, again, uh, of, of section 501-125B. So note one addresses the importance of considering exposed surface temperatures, both internal and external, as, as an ignition source. And note three references IEEE standard 1349, which is the IEEE guide for applications of electric motors in class one div two, uh, and class one zone two areas. Now, IEEE 1349 is uh, being revised with a lot of new information. However, today when we refer to 1349, we'll be referring to the 2011 edition, which is the uh, latest. Now, among the information found in 1349, uh, you'll find uh, a history of uh, using motors in classified areas. You'll find guidance on the minimum AIT for motor installations and the basis for their application plus many considerations necessary for installing motors in half of those locations and a variety of other discussions on motor application and construction. All right, so a quick look at 1349. Um, first, a little history. 1349 indicates that TFC motors have been used for many decades in half of those locations with no known incidents for motors up to five megawatts and less than six kV of course, when, when properly installed. So this fact by itself provides a solid basis for the application we're discussing today. Now, also know that this range encompasses a large amount of the industrial units, so it applies quite widely. Now, let's see, before going into, into uh, any further into 1349, uh, there's a couple of important points to make. First, it's very important that qualified persons that are knowledgeable of the hazards uh, found in classified areas be involved in the entire process of the design and specification of equipment. Know that, uh, by the way, that these are not only electrical um, disciplines, we were talking about uh, chemical or process engineering, mechanical, and so on. 
then uh, transparent communications with motor manufacturers and package, package equipment suppliers is the key. Uh, they must be aware of the environment and conditions that motor will be exposed to. That will be, become more clear in a few minutes. Uh, and it really falls on the designer, uh, design engineer, to uh, provide them the information. And last but certainly not least, uh, skilled technicians must install the electrical equipment properly. Okay. All right, now let's touch on TFC enclosures uh, for a minute. So even though TFC stands for totally enclosed fan cooled, TFC motors are not hermetically sealed and will allow the ingress of outside air into the motor, which can then contact the internal parts of such windings and water and so on. And of course, if faster those gases are present in the outside air, then they may ingress the motor too. Let's take a you know, let's look at the points of the slide. So a standard NEMA MG1, IEEE841, or API machine, they, they won't have motor surface temperatures in excess of 200 degrees C, at least under normal conditions. So this is good news for applications such as petrochemical plants and refineries, because the large majority of class one areas do not typically have flammable gases or vapors with AITs below 200 degrees C. Now, the hazards of the combustible gas ingress are exacerbated when the motor stops because the motor temperature increases immediately after stopping. So for example, I mean, uh, if you have a motor with a shaft driven fan and the fan slows down, then of course, then there's less airflow and there's cooling, right? Uh, another reason uh, is, uh, as explained in IEEE 1349, you can look it up there, is that there's a thin layer of air that forms on the rotor while spinning. And that layer acts as an insulating blanket. So when the motor stops, it's gone. That's to say, when the motor is operating, the resulting exposed surface temperature, right, of the rotor is somewhat cooler. But when the motor stops, that thin layer is gone. So the, the hot rotor surface can be directly exposed to that uh, air that's uh, coming to the motor. All right. Uh, then, as the motor temperature drops, right, inside the enclosure, it creates a negative pressure drawing air in near, uh, you know, whatever surrounding air is in the, uh, around the motor into the enclosure, right? So that then you can add it to uh, the conditions of the application. So you could have initial conditions that increase the motor temperature too, and they have to be considered. For example, uh, the motor being used be, be on its nameplate rating, you're using adjustable speed drives, the ambient temperature is over 40 degrees C, the load is increased or the speed is reduced immediately before stopping. And then there are other unusual conditions we'll briefly uh, touch on. So, you, you know, we can see a worst case scenario for motors in hazardous areas when a running motor stops while flammable gas is present, for example. Okay. All right, so a quick review before we continue. Uh, 1349 is aligned with the NEC with respect to not requiring T codes or special markings for TFC or other ventilated type motors for class 1D2 locations. Uh, then, as, with, as is the case with all equipment in hazardous areas, qualified personnel must evaluate the use of these motors uh, in the, in, for the particular area, right? And communication is key. When purchasing a motor, a complete data sheet is vital, so the manufacturer knows how the equipment is going to be used, the environment is in which it's going to be placed, uh, for example, okay? Now, it's carrying on with 1349. Uh, let's take a look at uh, table one. Now, first a disclaimer that what you see here, uh, this is an image, uh, it's on a portion, only a portion of uh, say, uh, table one, which is in section five of 1349. And the food table really should be reviewed for, for your application. Uh, a few important things to note, the table indicates maximum recommended exposure temperatures for several motor types, but not all of them are shown, all right? Now, not the 200 degrees C temperature limit covers the bulk of the low voltage motors and many medium voltage ones. Nevertheless, the maximum exposed temperature parameter must be known when specifying the motor because the supplier needs this information. So it also indicates a range of typical rotor temperatures at full load and a service factor of 1.0. Just remember that. Since the motor rotor operating temperature is a function of the load and the operating conditions. Now, it could be argued that because motors are not typically utilized at their full load rating, and hence, in these real world type applications, rotor temperatures should not reach the top end of their temperatures range, right? Uh, 
but this is really not on the endorsement to apply the motor outside of the recommended maximum exposure temperature. Also know that the third column that says uh, rotor cooling types shows two types of rotor cooling methods. One is non-ducted and the other one is axial duct. Axial meaning the ducts are parallel to the shaft. Although not shown though, the complete table one includes an axial pros radial type rotor cooling, radial meaning the ducts perpendicular to the shaft. And that's only for above NEMA, T, uh, NEMA frame TFC motors. Now, this is not common, but the maximum recommended exposure temperature for this type of uh, rotor cooling is uh, only 180 degrees C. Again, the full table needs to be consulted. All right. Now, the standard includes uh, uh, an important clarification related to this table. See, the motors should have exposed surface temperatures at or below the maximum class one division two exposed surface temperature in table one when built in, accord in accordance with NEMA MG1, IEEE 841, API 547, 546, or 541, and applied within the common application conditions outlined in section 5.1 is conveniently next to the table. Then that being the case, uh, the application conditions limit the use of the table and therefore we're going to review them briefly. All right, so this is a summary of the common application conditions in IEEE 1349. It's showing a few conditions that increase the temperature and are worth mentioning here, but also that may be familiar uh, to many of the folks. So, First, uh, the temperature rise exceeding class B at 1.0 service factor. Now, note the service factor. We get specifications with service factors of 115 uh, often. Uh, ambient temperatures over 40 degrees C, which is not common in the US, but uh, they do exist uh, even here. Operating beyond the nameplate conditions, uh, using adjustable speed drives, which is becoming more common. Altitudes about, above 1,000 meters, which is not that uncommon at all. Repeated motor starting beyond the motor limits, although modern protection release can help prevent this, still uh, to be considered, and variances in applied voltages and applied frequency, which are uh, typical. Now, there are other factors to consider and that are discussed in the standard, including NEMA NG1 inertia, the torque speed characteristics, uh, for example, is it an NEMA A or an NEMA B, what's the slip, and uh, voltage on balance. Uh, of course, within 1%, which is the norm. Now, unfortunately, we don't have time to dive into these conditions, but keep in mind that these and other conditions are discussed in IEEE 1349, and that they really should be reviewed for each application. Okay. Now, I want to mention another commonly used standard. And that's, uh, uh, I'm sorry, IEEE 841, which is the standard for petroleum and chemical industry for premium efficiency, severe duty TFC motors. And it includes motors up to 500 horsepower or 370 kW. So by the way, it's also in the revision pro process. So this standard is often used for induction motors in petrochemical facilities and includes information related to service conditions, uh, a few of which are on the slide. And as you can see, they generally agree with IEEE 1349. Uh, a sample data sheet for TFC motors, which can be used for specifying. Um, a, a lot of more items that uh, we, we really haven't shown here, All right? Now, as is typical of other IEEE documents, IEEE 841 is not mandatory unless the authority having jurisdiction states so within the specifications or status, stashes. Okay. So let's uh, summarize uh, what we got. Uh, always consider the internal and external temperatures of a motor, and you have to provide the necessary information to the suppliers such as classified area, temperature limitations, and so on. And you need to consult with them as needed, uh, especially if applications are outside of the norm. Then uh, check the application conditions in IEEE 1349. And remember to check the space heaters. And of course, you know, you could have an issue. So if there's a, a problem with the motor temperature, you can consider a few options. Uh, for example, you could provide a larger motor than required for the temperature exceeding the, the worst gas vapor AIT. You could use a different type of motor, such as explosion proof or perched. Uh, you could relocate the motor outside the classified location, but uh, those chances being are slim, uh, at least historically for me. And uh, you can also check for inspiration in NEC uh, 500 per seven, which offers other protection techniques that you could employ, such as installing gas detection and so on. 
Now, if the issue is the space heater, then the solution could be, for example, asking a manufacturer to provide uh, more, but smaller water heaters, uh, or you could provide heaters marked for the location or with a TECO. Okay. Now, um, we need to start wrapping up. So this is, uh, I'm gonna leave you with this uh, little diagram that shows the decision-making process that we've been discussing. And it's really just meant as a high-level guide to summarize the thought process involved in applying the TFC motors and the condensation heaters, anti-condensation heaters to class one, two locations. Again, it is not intended to encompass everything one needs to know um, and consider, but uh, it should it should help you go through the uh, at least through the thought process, right? So let's see. If you go to the to the middle, the big uh, rectangle, yeah. Uh, to the left of that, you'll see a, a red box. It says uh, gas vapor AIT motor surface temperatures. Uh, I'm sorry, less than the motor surface temperature, right? Or the motor enclosures are producing. So if you go to 501-125B, you're going to end up with a class 1D1 motor or a class 1D2 motor identified for the area. Or maybe you need to uh, use some other mitigation technique, right? Okay, so then back to the, the box in the middle. If you go down... Uh, a summary on the space heaters, real quick. Temperatures need to be 80% or below uh, of the AI, uh, gas or vapor AIT who are identified for the area. And then to the right hand side on the uh, uh, green frame box, this is what we've been talking about today uh, gas or vapor AIT above 200 degrees C or a T code of T3. And there, uh, if you go to 501 125B, it, it tells you non sparking parts. Uh, exposed surface temperatures below the gas vapor AIT. And it, the informational node sends you to IEEE 1349. And that's when we started talking about the table with the different cooling types and so on, and the uh, uh, the temperatures mostly 200 degrees C, right? Uh, and then we talked about uh, section 5.1, which is common applications. So this is uh, we need to pay, pay a, a good amount of attention. Some of this we already went through, uh, really, so I won't repeat it, but uh, I do want to mention at the bottom where it says fixed speed sinusoidal input, no ASDs. You need to, to uh, one way to do that, uh, to deal with that is to consider IEEE 841 or, uh, and to go to 1349 section 632. Uh, there, there's a good discussion on 1349 about uh, applying ASDs to, uh, to the areas. So I think that is all the time I got. So uh, anyway, we'll wrap up the session and uh, let us know if you have any questions. Anchor. Thanks, Eddie. We do have a number of questions that have been rolling in. So for this first one, I think this could go to either uh, you or Eddie. But for those of us who don't have an electrical background, can you explain exactly what Class One Division Two means and how it gets defined for a greenfield project? Why don't we go to uh, Carlos first? So well, okay, for any project, but so. Green, for a greenfield project, meaning there's nothing there, right? Like Eddie said, once we get to a certain point, uh, we will know the materials that are being handled in the facility. Let's just pick the PFD. From that point, we'll start building up a, a, a database of materials and where they are located. So we applied a standard, for example, it, it could be API 500, for example. And uh, using that, we develop uh, maps that tell us where these uh, class and divisions uh, exist. So division two means that not the gas or vapor involved is not normally there, but class one division two, the gas or vapor involved is not normally there, as opposed to div one where it would be commonly there. I, 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 uh, I don't have a probability number to give you, but that's that's really w what it is. It's, it's uh, if everything is working okay, right? Then uh, the gas should be not, not be there under normal circumstances. Eddie probably can do a better job than that. No, actually, that was covered pretty well, but uh, I do have a couple of thoughts here for if you're a non-electrical person and are not familiar with the class uh, div type uh, philosophy that we use, there are also in the code book a uh, zone methodology that we can use, and the IEC world also uses the zone method. Um, it's very similar, and the same principle is the class div method, but there, there are there are some differences, some major differences. So you can't interchange necessarily um, 
something that you would put in a class one div two area into a zone one or two area because they're not the same. So um, also I want to point out the the some of the differences or, or what Carlos just touched on as far as the um, the class one div one area, then that means you're going to have flammable gases or vapors um, that could create a combustion under uh, normal circumstances and, and you have them in quantity sufficient enough to create that combustion. Class one div two, on the other hand, is like Carlos was saying is uh, you would have to have under abnormal conditions and we're not talking about um, Armageddon type situation where a, a, a million gallon oil tank ruptures or anything, nothing like that. But let's say you blew a seal on a pump and it was spraying uh, gasoline mist into the air. Well, that could create uh, enough mixture or the right mixture and enough of it present to create an ignitable mixture. But under normal circumstances, it wouldn't be happens. It wouldn't happen. So basically, um, in a class one div two area, you're looking at a you would be looking at a double double jeopardy type situation there, and that's why we're we we're allowed a little bit more uh, leniency as far as the equipment that we put into these areas. But, and that's a that's a big one, is that you have to remember that um, whoever is working in those areas and designing these areas have to be qualified and experienced uh, to know all of the hazards present because um, even the, the, the smallest spark can set off uh, some really bad chain of events. Thank you guys. All right, and that's actually a good lead into our next question. What specifically defines engineering judgment as qualified? Eddie, why don't we go to you first on that one? Um, you know, that, that's defined across many standards. OSHA, uh, let's say part 1910 subpart S and 1926 subpart K, they, they define qualified persons. Uh, then the NEC defines qualified persons. And then there's other uh, places in API standards and such. So that's really subjective. Um, just because, let's say, like me, you're old, um, and that doesn't mean, uh, let's say, for instance, I'm a good electrician. Uh, and that's questionable sometimes, but um, anyway, if if I say, well, I'm qualified to do that, well, what does that mean? Does that mean that I've I'm old and I've got experience, so therefore I must know what I'm doing? No. Um, does it mean that I went to school for eight years and got a PhD, but I've never done one of these situations before? Does that make me qualified? No, it makes you really smart, but it doesn't make you experienced. Therefore, you're probably not qualified to to do that. You have to have a combination of uh, a lot of knowledge, uh, formal education, and the experience and the years that go behind it to make your to make you really qualified. But as far as the you know the definition, uh, code panels have struggled for years trying to get their hands around what exact. How do you quantify? what makes up a qualified person because we all bring different skill sets to the table. Carlos, did you have anything to add to that? No, not really, but that's in, in the US, right? We were talking the other day about this. Uh, in other places, there are such a thing as a training to become uh, certified. certified for handling this type of stuff, right? That is a good point. I forgot all about that, but you're right. In the IEC world, um, they actually do have what's called COMPX certifications, and there's 10, 11 of them. Um, what, several types. Uh, one is for like uh, manufacturers to that showing that they're qualified to make that product. Uh, for electricians, that they're qualified installers. Uh, they, unfortunately, uh, and, and of course, they have others like for engineers, for process engineers, and things like that. Unfortunately, in the United States, not yet have we gotten to that level where we've put in place a certification protocol such as that to, to help define what the qualified person is. But I think it's coming. 
soon. It's probably sooner yeah. than later. Okay. All right. Thanks for the discussion there. Carlos, this uh, next question will be for you. If you tell the manufacturer the AIT of the gas or vapor, will the manufacturer make sure that the motor is acceptable? <laughs> uh, well, I would hope so. But, uh, you know, you tell them the information, not just that, but all of the information in your data sheet, right? And uh, you should get back from the manufacturer feedback saying, okay, based on what you're giving me, this is, this is the motor, right? And you may have to ask the manufacturer for data. I mean, when you're when you in these common applications, you, you probably should be okay. But there, there could be cases where you have a T-code that is uh, high or you know, uh, on AIT that's low. And uh, then you really have to check. And that the manufacturer is, is, you have to ask them questions. You cannot just say, oh, you know, he said to use this guy and he gave me a price. You, you should really check the, the, you should back check the manufacturer, honestly, especially in applications that are unusual. I don't, I don't, is that? I think I think that's that's a good answer, yeah, yeah. Carlos. Uh, this next one will be for you, Eddie. Um, so to be on the safe side, should we be choosing a motor that whose T rating is below the AIT rating of a process classified area? No, uh, not necessarily. The like I said, the. Um, I guess I kind of touched on it, but didn't really say it out loud before. Um, table 500.8 in the National Electric Code in, in 2020, and it's been that number for the same, for a while now, but has the T codes. And for, a two, let's say that what we've been talking about today is the 200 degree C rating. And I touched a little bit while ago about uh, on the fact that when, let's say you've got the right mixture of hazardous or flammable gas present, in the area and that motor stops uh, that, that we were talking about, the rotor is gonna heat up. Let's say you've now you've got that rotor at 200, and 200 degrees, just dead on, for example, and you've got the exact amount of uh, mixture that you need to create a, an ignition, a combustible mixture. If it's gonna come in, con if it comes in contact with that hot rotor, um, chances are very 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 slim that something will happen but you know there's no mathematical formula that i'm aware of or any of the experts that i uh, know in the industry that have ever been able to really get their hands around uh, an equation because there's just too many variables involved and so uh, the odds are greatly in your favor, if you if you pick out a uh, an uh, IEEE 841 motor or a 541 IEEE 541 motor, um, that you're not going to have an issue if it says that it's uh, if if you've got a T3 uh, temperature code in that location. Now, if you let's say have a T3C location, now we got it may have a problem um, because that means that it can't get up to 200 degrees C, it's somewhere down below that temperature. So uh, I don't have the table right here in front of me or memorized, but um, let's say it's 150 degrees C and you have that same uh, mixture of gas that we were talking about a while ago and it touches that hot rotor at 200 degrees C. Uh, you may not have a problem, but there's you could not defend that really. It would be very hard to defend that if something did happen and you were the designer that knowingly put a motor that could get to 200 degrees C in a T3C location. So um, you can see. Uh, uh, let me uh, Eddie. Uh, let me help you out here. So mm -hmm. one one example of of that is uh, if you go to 1349 at um, Appendix for attachment H. There, that's where they they show you the tables where they did the testing, and you can see from the tables, you know, the the AIT of the mixture, and uh, the rotor temperature when ignition occurred, and so on, right? And so, so, so you, you, I mean, it becomes clear when you look at the table what, what he's saying. You, that you really shouldn't go that way. 
right? You can't. You should yeah, see it that way. I'm glad you brought that up, Carlos, because um, 1349, as it stands right now, that's the 2011 version. Yeah. Um, and I, I've been on that commit working group now for about two years, and it, it's it's growing exponentially in in information and size, um, like all standards do as we learn more. But um, there's going to be a lot of information coming out shortly. Uh, it should be issued probably at the beginning of next year. I'm not sure when the PAR says that our, our due date is, but it, it's getting close. So be on the lookout for that, but definitely if you're in this business, uh, you should be intimately familiar with uh, IEEE 1349. And um, I also encourage you, and I'm gonna take a, a minute here to uh, be the mentor and say, hey guys, we need we need help. We need your knowledge on these panels and uh, working groups. And I mean, there's a ton of folks out there that have just enormous amounts of knowledge and experience that these working groups and code panels can use. So, um, please, if if you you know if that's something you've ever considered doing, giving back some of your knowledge to our industry, uh, there's openings on every uh, working group for IEEE. It's just a matter of getting out there and volunteering. So I encourage you to do that. It's I guarantee you I've learned a whole lot more on these panels than I've ever contributed. So um, it's good. Thanks for that, Eddie. And that's always important to remind our, our technical experts. Uh, Carlos, another question for you. You mentioned that uh, even though TEFC stands for totally enclosed, a TEFC enclosure um, usually still allows gas ingress. Is it possible to have an enclosure that does not allow any gas ingress? Hmm. I guess you could. Uh, I don't know. Well, th this is the thing, though. You always, even if you seal the entire motor, and I know I'm a motor manufacturer, so I'm kind of just talking. But even if you if you weld every seam, you still have the uh, uh, the, the rotating shaft got at least one bearing, and you know I don't know. If, if, I find it difficult to believe that they're under no conditions you won't get anything in there, at least not a gas, maybe liquid, but a gas. Uh, I find it hard to believe. It may be possible. I don't know if any that could say hundred percent. Definitely not TEFC motors. I don't think there is such a right, thing. Right, not there. TEFC. No. Yeah. You would you would have to go to something like a, a pressurized or a purge type uh, TEFC motor. Oh, okay, but then you're, but you're cheating because then you're putting pressure right. the other way. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, there's. Uh, but it, no, I agree that what your answer, what you what you said is true that. I'm not aware of any, uh, if you call up a motor manufacturer and say, hey, I want a TEFC motor, but I don't want it, any gas to be able to get into it. I don't know that there's an animal like that out there yet. There could be. There could be. But um, the thing is, talking about when Carlos was saying that that's cheating. Well, uh, actually, <laughs> he was joking, obviously, but um, what... It is is a protection technique that's found in uh, the NEC 500.7, and it discusses I think 11 different. Uh, there's purge and pressurization. There's gas detection that Carlos mentioned earlier. Um, there are different ways that you can apply these types of, of equipment, like TEFC motors, um, in an area, but you may have to go to a little more. Uh, trouble as far as you know making sure that you've got backup protection for it in case something does happen that it will take it out of service or it's positive pressure on the motor all the time and will alarm if 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 the alarm um, if the pressurization system fails and uh, of course nfpa 496 addresses uh purge and pressurization of uh, like type x y and z pressurizations All right. Thank you, guys. Carlos, we're getting a question. Should engineers and designers ask for certified motor data sheet from our vendors and motor manufacturers? Certified data sheets. 
Okay, so it depends what, uh, let's just say if you are buying a standard off the shelf motor, you don't want anything special, right? You're looking at something like that. Uh, uh, that should be, there should be data sheets readily available that give you the info, a, a lot of information. Maybe not exactly what we're talking about, but all the information. Now, if you're buying a, a, a unique piece of machinery on API 541 motor, then yeah. Yeah. I mean, about, when I say, when in my head, when you mean cert, say certified, I mean, it's been tested. You know, that particular specific machine has been tested. Maybe I didn't get the question right. But there are data sheets available, the manufacturer does for that particular off the shelf motor. And that's really what you're going to get. Now, there may be data they have, I'm sure that we, you know, we'll have to ask for if you want more information. But if I, if I say to somebody, I, I want a certified uh, data sheet or information on this motor, then, then it means for that one motor. So it's, it's a, maybe it's a wording issue. Well, pointing back, I guess pointing back to um, the code again in 110.3b, where it talks about uh, equipment has to be used within its listing, labeling, and per the manufacturer's instructions and things like that. Right. Basically, you're talking about certifications, and um, so it's it's always important. You know, if that if you have a motor data sheet, you specify on there exactly what you're doing. If you're going to put this TEFC motor in a, with material types C and D in the area, then they need to know that. If you're using it for where hydrogen may be present, um, it changes it changes the ball game, and you may have to the manufacturer may have to offer you a different type of motor or um, one of their other products that have been evaluated, uh, not necessarily listed, but evaluated for right. that use. But it's more like a self cert. I mean, it's not like a third party certificate. It's like a cert certification, maybe. And even if it's a third party certification, maybe some of the data involved wasn't certified at the time. You know what I mean? Right. When you, when you, when you get information back from these guys that say, this is what the model will do, you, ta you take it as the truth. I mean, there, we're, we're, unless it's a, a machine that's uh, uh, purpose built, then that's different. That's, that's what I was trying to say. Thank you guys. All right, I think we have time for maybe one last question. There was mention of motors that don't typically exceed 200 degrees Celsius or some other temperature. If there's a vapor with a low AIT, how would a field inspector be sure that the insulation is proper? I think the well, local inspector should answer that. <laughs> um, yeah. The, the thing is here is um, if, if you're, a, let's say, a, a municipal inspector, and uh, the reason I'm struggling to answer here is uh, the guy that's out there that's supposed to, uh, in a large city, that's supposed to do just electrical, not, not a one-man show um, that does it all. L let's say we're going to, but most likely he's this guy, let's say in the city of Houston, he's not going to be in refineries. Um, looking at hazardous classified locations, most likely. There are some states, um, such as California, Alaska, and, and places like that, that actually do allow the inspector, state inspectors into the, the uh, unit, into the process units. But most likely, your average inspector that inspects apartments and then a donut shop and a manufacturing facility are, is not going to have that that type of experience. Uh, it'd be like, I guess, calling in a heart surgeon to do back surgery. And so not only does the team that's designing in these locations have to be skilled and qualified and experienced and all that, but the inspectors also have to be qualified to know what they're looking at. And if they are, they would know they need the data sheet and they need the hazardous area classification plan and all the documentation that goes with it. And it'll become pretty obvious at that point whether that motor is going to work or not, and or and be safe. All right, thanks. And maybe one more question. Uh, where was it? 
What are the common safeguards for protecting the motor corresponding to temperature fluctuations and adjustable speed drives? Common safeguards. Well, I would say safeguard number one is don't put it there. Uh, honestly, so what happens with variable speed drives and it gets a little fuzzy. 1349 has a lot of information, right? Well, let me give you an example. The, the rotor temperature, which is the, uh, in most cases, the limiting condition. Uh, varies by uh, uh, the carrier frequency of the drive, right? So you have a PWN drive, which is a common thing nowadays, right? I, I, you change the carrier frequency, it can ch it'll change the rotor temperature. So, I mean, there's a lot of detail to be considered. I don't know that there's a common safeguard. I really try to avoid them if at all possible. But again, this is one of those things, I think 841 will help you with the situation. But uh, uh, it would be one of those, hey, you know what? Let's talk about them to the manufacturer. This is a drive we have. This is how we're setting the drive. Make sure that the speed variations are okay with them. Make sure issues with carrier frequency are okay. That sort of thing. I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't have a better answer. I know we're just about out of time, but I do want to uh, add here that the new 1349, when it comes out, is gonna have an expanded discussion on um, ASDs or adjustable speed drives. Thank you guys. That is all the time we have for questions today. So to Eddie and Carlos, thank you both for the presentation and the discussion and all the questions. To our audience, we appreciate all of you for attending and your engagement today. It's been a pleasure being your moderator. We'll be hosting our next webinar on Thursday, October 29th at 10 a.m. Central Time. In this webinar, Floor Senior Fellow Henry Kister will talk about some popular pressure control schemes their strengths, weaknesses, and some common troubleshooting issues. Keep in touch with your floor contacts, follow our social media postings, or head to the Innovation Builders page on floor.com to register for future webinars. We appreciate your attention and thank you again for dialing in today. We will send out a compiled list of the Q&As within a few days. We will notify you when the webinar recording is available on floor.com. If you have any questions or require additional information, please email innovation.builders at floor.com and someone from our team will get back to you. From all of us in the Innovation Builders team, have a safe day. Thank you.